about 382 AD. In the days of Jerome, known for the Latin Vulgate, a new term began to circulate in Bible scholarship, according to R.H. Charles. Certain texts of historical value, and even canon, were now labeled as something other than inspired scripture. The very concept is a clear redefining of books already in existence, and in most cases, text recorded as inspired scripture and Bible canon now somehow in question by those without any such authority. This paradigm remains today even further rooted as if it ever represented the historical approach to these Old Testament texts as some vet as truth. How do these texts stand up to the Torah test? The answer on many of these books will likely shock especially scholars who have never actually conducted such research, which becomes evident. It's not in their paradigm. This canon was already chosen before there were Pharisees in Jerusalem and before there was ever a Catholic church. Those factions do not get to legitimately form councils to vote on that, which was already settled, fact, long before, even in archaeology. You are entering a zone for truth with our new Apocrypha test series. Follow along and together we will dispel the myths of modern scholarship and man are they profoundly lacking in intellect on this topic you will see. Not anymore. Download your copies of Volume 1 and Volume 2 of our comprehensive Apocrypha research free in ebook today or get your copies at apocryphatest.com. All links are there. We now begin. Now, finally, the topic many have been asking for for years. We have been waiting for this moment uh, to get to the book of Tobit because it is the best example as to how the biblical tithe operates. Uh, so much so, by the way, that we're going to go ahead and launch this as a new series. Uh, the first two videos will be about Tobit, so we'll have them in the Apocrypha series, but we'll also use them to anchor a new series uh, on biblical tithing. Uh, and then we're going to expound on that with at least uh, three, it looks like, more videos. And yeah, we're going to go into the scriptures. Don't worry, we're going to get there. Uh, over these five videos. We're going to explain the Bible tithe, something that many scholars don't even have an inkling of. Many times they'll say, oh, well, you know, the tithe in the Old Testament was 23%. Are you stupid, scholar? Uh, tithe means tenth, not 23%. You can't read. Oh, and by the way, what's the origin of that doctrine? Well, what it's the stretching of Josephus, the Pharisee, because, well, they censored the best source explaining this dynamic. How about that? So this video and the next one really are going to be mostly Tobit, though we're going to bring uh, the modern canon in some, especially Deuteronomy, because Tobit is actually applying Deuteronomy accurately, because he could read, see, Josephus couldn't. And even in 90 AD, yes, the Pharisees had changed the tithe. And then the modern church picks up on that and demonizes it because they're too dumb to realize that they are, they're perpetrating a Pharisee lie that is not the interpretation of the Old Testament tithe. How about that? Now, Tobit was a prophet. Josephus was a Pharisee liar. You tell me. Who should we believe? What's worse is they can't even read Tobit. The few who use it to explain tithing uh, also, take Tobit out of context, applying an annual reference uh, within, because there is one uh, regarding this second year tithe, different from the other two years. And while well, it merely says Tobit took that tithe, uh, the, the second year's increase tithe from it, uh, and that he set it aside. Then he spent it every year. Well, duh, spending it every year is not giving it every year. 
I mean, it's it, the language is there, and it's so obvious, yet uh, it's really poor what we've seen. Uh, so basically, from the fund every year, and we're going to explain, Tobit was giving in a three-year cycle, one purpose the first year, another purpose the second year, another purpose the third year, and oh, uh, that's what Deuteronomy says we should be doing. Oh, what? What? Really? We're not supposed to just give 10% to the church every year? Does the church even qualify for a tithe? Oh, that's a big question we're going to deal with, number one. Number two, uh, was all of the tithe every year given to the temple priests? And the answer is no. And we're going to address that. So let's go to this and let's understand it like never before because we can. And again, we'll take you to Deuteronomy in this video too. But this is going to be five parts uh, at least, and I'm sure we'll add to it after that. But this is awesome, and uh, everybody is going to glean some understanding out of this, we believe. Some do uh, understand it, but many don't. And uh, we have this chart in Apocrypha Volume 2. You can download it free uh, in ebook, uh, apocryphatest.com. Uh, the whole book for that matter, but certainly the chart. It's all there in the Book of Tobit portion, uh, and that's what we're going to be teaching from, but of course sharing much more uh, in Scripture. This is amazing. Wait till you see this. Now, most know a tithe is 10%. A tenth of what? Of our increase that year. It's not about net or gross or any of those divisive arguments, and we're not even going to get into that because it doesn't matter. Understand? Uh, you decide the tithe, okay? However, it is a mechanism Yahuwah installed. Uh, did he take it away? Well, we'll get there. Uh, we'll start with the manner in which Tobit tithe, which bear in mind... Tobit gave offerings over and above that. He calls them almsgiving. Uh, and this video is specific to straighten out the understanding of how the tithe work. The next video, we're going to talk more about almsgiving as well. Offerings, which is what almsgiving is, uh, are different. And yeah, we should all give. Given it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, run and over shall men give unto your bosom, right? I mean, we know the scriptures, yet... We're missing that that's the New Testament, and yeah, you still give. Did the New Testament ever stop giving? No. Did the New Testament ever stop tithing? N no. Uh, is there a scripture where Yahushua said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now stop tithing! <laughs> what? That's ridiculous. This is what scholars do to the Bible. It is the dumbest paradigm imaginable. They'll say, oh, but the New Testament doesn't say that you tithe. The New Testament never changes the tithe. See, the problem is you got this massive thing here because Messiah says in Matthew 5, 17 through 20 that all the tenets of the very law in place at the time that he said it, well, Matthew 5 is the famous Sermon on the Mount where he supposedly gave new law, yet he starts with, I'm not going to give you new law. Oops. Can you read, scholars? Clearly not. Um, then he tells you not one letter of the law that is in existence right now, the law of Moses, same law we are in today. Oh, that's the law of sin and death. No, it's not. What a ridiculous characterization that these churches, these seminarians are out there attacking Moses and attacking Yahuwah. Don't you know Yahuwah wrote part of that with his very finger? Who do you think you're attacking, scholar? How stupid. But let's get into this. So offerings are different, as I said. We're going to get there in the next video. Uh, so to whom are we to give to? When do we give? And how? Uh, now, this is something that I can't believe it's so messed up. But it is. It really is in most interpretations. I'm not saying some don't have it right out there. Perhaps some do. Uh, frankly, though, read what Google brings up on this. Because, of course, Google knows everything. Google knows nothing, typically. I mean, it, it's lousy, it, it, the, the way that the algorithm works, because we experience it every day. 
um, we put out better, uh, more uh, well-proven videos on some topics than any scholar ever has. But you won't see us come up first on that topic, will you? Uh, in fact, you usually won't even see us on the first page. Uh, and that's okay, because you know what? Those who uh, are seeking the truth will find us largely. So you will find there uh, are many out there saying that the Bible has no tithe for the New Testament. That's, that's what they say. You'll see it time and time again. There's no tithe in the New Testament. Tithing is not in the New Testament. Tithing is not a New Testament principle. Is that even true? Well, we're going to get there too. Uh, and yes, we'll go to the New Testament in, uh, I don't know, maybe part three, part four, somewhere in there within this series. And we'll show you what the New Testament says about tithing. What? It does? Yes, it does. Oh, I know somebody wants to argue with that already. No, you're not. You will be muted if you try to debate in ignorance before we even get to the topic. Duh. Our channel, our rules. Uh, or you get a church who demands a tithe. Have we all had that? We've heard from many from one of the big mega churches, especially in the Philippines, uh, that will come to your workplace if you don't come to church on Sunday and collect your tithe. Uh, they have a deal with some of the big malls and, and employers, and they'll even actually take it directly out of your paycheck, just like taxes, you know, your tithe comes out directly. Now, I don't have a problem with that if it's voluntary. I like that myself. It's easier. Uh, I used to always have mine come right out of my paycheck when I could. But do they even have such a right is the question. Is the church who we pay the biblical tithe to? Hmm. Let's understand what a tithe is first. The book of Tobit from Apocrypha volume 2 chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 we're going to cover here. Uh, understand this is the beginning of the story right at the beginning when Tobit still lived in northern Israel. He will soon, after this, be taken into Assyria with the rest of the northern tribes. He will continue to give, though. Uh, and yes, he gives offerings over and above his tithe, but how did it work? Of course, he couldn't go to Jerusalem for the feast at that time. Uh, he was in captivity. So, unfortunately, you know, not like we are told in most cases. And this is so sad. It's such a foundational, basic principle that actually comes with promises because when we tithe we are promised that there will be blessings and it's not about name it claim it it's not about you know some watered down you know uh all about you gospel that's just a tenet in the bible given it shall be given unto you right i mean th this is uh this is a norm said messiah uh and and we see it over and over even in proverbs but also in tobit uh, how important it is to give. This is, I mean, I tell you, guys, we should all be givers. I mean, you, you cannot show love more than to give, right? Now, but I alone went often to Jerusalem at the feasts. Now, remember, Tobit wrote this between 6 and 700 BC. Yes, that's when he wrote it. Stupid scholars that take a, uh, a copy of, of a scroll that was copied over as the Bible tradition is for everything else um, and say, oh, well, that copy is dated to about 100 uh, BC or so. So that's when Tobit was written. That, I mean, that is, those are illiterate idiots. They don't know how to assess uh, because, see, they're not applying the same, uh, the, the same criteria that they do to Genesis. The Genesis copies maybe date to 200, 300 BC in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, does that mean Genesis was written then? Well, no. I mean, maybe some do say that because they're really dumb, but no one really says that. The reality is they know that Moses wrote Genesis, right? Well, Tobit wrote the book named after him too. So he says in the text, and we covered that already. And the first temple uh, still stood at this time. Understand that. The rest of Tobit's family in northern Israel, uh, the tribe of Naphtali, 
were mostly guilty of idol worship and the reason his people, including him, would go into captivity, in fact. He alone in his family, he says, uh, gave biblically and kept the law, the Sabbaths, the feasts, still visiting Jerusalem as he should. Uh, he didn't relocate there in order to go to the temple three times a year. Uh, some read a scripture uh, in Chronicles and try to read it that way. And then they don't bother to go and look at the first verse of the next passage, next chapter, which says, and they return to their own villages. I, I, pretty dumb. Yet they use that to say that northern tribes relocated into the southern kingdom, which never happened. As it was ordained unto all the people of Israel by an everlasting decree. We, we all know what everlasting means, right? That means it does not pass away and cannot. And included in that definition of Israel by Moses, as we've covered in several passages, the Gentile, or stranger among them, were always part of the very same law. Uh, he was clear they had one law, not two. And the Gentile was never under something different and even had salvation in the Old Testament. Yes, Old Testament people were saved. That's not new in the New Testament. Uh, they had the same promise of Messiah's second coming that we do. We have covered those scriptures many times. Uh, we especially do in Rest, the case for Sabbath, available free in ebook at restsabbath.org, uh, or watch our Sabbath series and feasts of YHWH, Yahua series especially. They kept the law and they benefited the same as the rest of Israel. We have all the passages there. And they had the same curses when they broke it. And they too went into captivity. Yes, Gentiles did as well. There were even Gentiles in the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, it was a mixed multitude. I, I don't understand why scholars don't know these things. They should. The law was never only for a bloodline. Never. That's not Bible. And that's why Paul is not espousing any new doctrine when he says neither Hebrew, Hebrew nor Greek, because that's quoting Moses. That wasn't new. Yahuwah's ways are Yahuwah's ways always. And he changes not. And they are for everyone, period. Israel stood out because it was the first nation as a people. Abraham was not a nation yet, but he basically had a village. The patriarchs were people, small groups, basically, villages. Uh, but now an entire nation of millions entered covenant together, and that included the Gentile among them, said Moses many times. We've covered that. So let's continue. Having the first fruits and tenths of increase, that's called the tithe, tenths, tithe, same word, uh, we'll explain, with that which was first shorn, you know, like shearing the wool from a sheep, right? That's shorn, uh, given of the first fruits of it. And then gave I at the altar to the priests, the children of Aaron. Is this what he always did every year? No. Whoops. He's going to tell you. He hasn't told you the timing yet. He's about to. The Levites, that's the children of Aaron, right? Uh, in the times of the temple, uh, that will become uh, the sons of Zadok specifically, who were sons of Aaron. It's that whole bloodline, but they were the leadership of the temple. And again, even in Tobit's time. Did he say he gave to the temple priests every year? No. He did not say that, and he's about to give us the timing, so don't imply one when it's not there. Uh, now, he'll break it down in timing and method. This, this is the brilliance of Scripture, because this detail has actually been there all along, and yet scholars will go back and forth and back and forth. Oh, I think it was this way. I think it was this way. I think it was this way. Why don't we just go to Scripture and find it? Why don't we go to the ancient precedents and find it? See, when we teach things, we're teaching them with an ancient precedence. We're not making it up. And these aren't new doctrines. This is the way the Bible was taught and still should be. You can see the many changes over the years. 
Okay, so it is, uh, it is biblical to give to the temple priests, yes, uh, who are doing what? Well, they execute the Sabbaths and the feasts, uh, and they had no inheritance of the land, you'll see. Uh, they had no means of income. They had no farming operations. They had no cattle. You'll see later that Pharisees have many of those things. They even had businesses set up on the steps of the temple. Those guys are ridiculously evil and not temple priests. They are imposters. Uh, they took over the temple in 165 BC, and Yahusha certainly put them in their place many times, but there he turns over the tables for a reason. Pawnbroking, banking, he didn't like, certainly, but he certainly didn't like it, uh, that Pharisees were conducting such business on the steps of the very temple. So, was Tobit giving tithes every year? Yes. Now you'll see this, but he was not giving to the temple priests every year. He has three different initiatives, three different purposes for his giving. Is that Bible? Yes. We'll show you. We'll provide the detail. Is your pastor a temple priest? Is he performing that function? Well, is he keeping the biblical feast? Whoops. Hmm. Is he keeping the biblical Sabbath? Hmm. Or is he preaching against it? Now, that's a problem because that's a doctrine Paul never preached. That's a new, strange doctrine. This is a paramount issue in our age, and in determining whom we would even tithe to, right, is pretty important, but we'll get there. Let's keep reading because this is not the only breakdown of how the tithe is to work per scripture. It's there in Deuteronomy, so we're going to take you there. Uh, but let's do Tobit first. So Tobit, again, is accurate to the Bible. Same thing. we got a match here, and we'll show you how. This is a huge key many are awakening to in this age of increasing knowledge. And remember, you asked for this. Yes, many of you did. Uh, we've been asked this question by hundreds of people at least, maybe even more than a thousand. Uh, and we're happy to cover it and glad we got here. Now, as scripture does often, Tobit specifically breaks down the details of how the tithe works. Yeah, we're going to take our time with this and we're going to explain it. We're going to teach, okay? So anyone that really isn't here to learn, just get out. You, you don't belong. You're not mature enough. We understand. That's okay. You can leave. Go find some watered down channel that will tell you what you want to hear and tickle your ears. We're just not going to do that here. We don't play those games. He did not provide them yet. That, this is that detail, okay? So uh, what we read so far doesn't tell you exactly how it works. So it's amazing that the church generally focuses on passages from the law uh, of Moses in order to collect a tithe. But wait a minute. They then reject the law of Moses, <laughs> claiming it passed away. Well, which is it? It's called hypocrisy. That's what it's called. Um, they, they have no right to something that they teach against, right? I mean, and, and we'll show you John MacArthur, uh, he then rephrases it, that when you're giving to the church, you're not actually giving a tithe, uh, because to him, a tithe is 23%, because, well, he can't do math and he doesn't understand, even though he explains a tithe is 10%, he then tells you the Old Testament tithe is 23 because he's following Josephus very stupidly. He doesn't know how to read the Bible. Oh, not that part. Give us the money. <laughs> Still, we, we want our money, says the church. But abolish the rest, of course. Uh, again, what are they teaching? They're teaching lawlessness. They're teaching against the biblical law. What is that? According to James, that's called sin. The church is teaching sin when they do so. Now, nonsense. Talk about a double standard. Uh, it just doesn't work. In Matthew 5, 17 through 20, read it. We're not even going to cover it because we have so many times. Messiah said his law, uh, the one from Moses installed at the time in which he spoke and which he obeyed and taught, or he would be a sinner, oops, by biblical definition, because the law of Moses was still in place, no matter how you look at it, in his time, they claim that his, his 
Uh, death and resurrection brought a new law, which is ridiculous uh, and unscriptural in every sense. He would have told you that if that's what he meant. The fact that he did not, you know, say, stop tithing. And he didn't come and say, stop keeping the feast. Uh, but instead, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, he says not one letter of this law that we have right now will pass away. He continues with the Sermon on the Mount, in which he especially discusses six tenets of the law of Moses. And he explains some, which are being misinterpreted by the Pharisees, as things people say, right? And others shall say from times of old, meaning from Moses. Um, and, and what's he doing? He's agreeing with Moses on all six of those tenets. He is not changing it on either one. Not a single one is changed. We cover that in the Sabbath series. Watch the Sermon on the Mount video. So yes, we have whole denominations whose foundational doctrine is to accuse Yahusha to be a sinner. They just don't think about it. They, they just ignore what they're doing. They, they don't realize because if they did, they'd be like, oh, I can't say that. He knew no sin, right? That's what the New Testament says over and over. So if he knew no sin, that means he never broke the law. But he broke the Sabbath. No, he didn't ever break the Sabbath. No, not legally. And we explain that in our Sabbath series. We cover those passages one by one. It's all in rest the book as well. He said the law, not one letter of it can pass away until when? He dates it, the day of judgment. When heaven and earth pass, that only happens on the day of judgment. Just go read Peter, uh, go read Revelation. It's there. The timing is obvious. So that is what he said. There is no other opinion on the matter. Uh, no other church doctrine that can even matter. Because scripture should be their foundation. Whenever a doctrine tested with scripture doesn't match, throw it out. It's a doctrine of men. Any scholar debating Messiah well, is an occult agitator and an unbeliever. Let's just call them what they are. Yes, he fulfilled it, and that means he kept it fully. That's what the word means. Uh, we cover this in scripture and even in Webster's Dictionary. And sadly, most seminaries don't know how to use a dictionary, it appears. The word fulfilled never means passed away. That's stupid. And that is extremely poor English in most churches and seminaries today that is being taught. It's pretty bad when they can't even speak English, their own language, but change definitions of words well known to make their doctrines work. That's a pretty lame, weak doctrine, is it not? Test it for yourself. Now, Tobit breaks this down into three years of tithing. I told you we'd take our time with this, and we will. One, the first year. One, the second year. And one, the third year. These are not added to each other any of those years in some quadratic formula requiring an algorithm to figure out. The Bible is far simpler, not so complex. Tobit will explain this and will show you he is giving biblically matching Deuteronomy. Don't know why the church doesn't know this. Don't care because we're going to straighten this out once and for all in this video and the next ones. There is no mystery here. Nothing to even be taken out of context, really. So let's read. The first tenth, tithe, part of all increase, that's what a tithe is, it is a 10% of your increase that year. Now, I gave to the sons of Aaron who ministered at Jerusalem. Now, he just repeated, for clarity's sake, as prophets do many times, so that we can't take it out of context, uh, what he just said in verse 6, the verse before. He gave to which sons of Aaron, though? The Levites who managed the temple, the sons of Zadok. Uh, they man managed the temple worship uh, in Jerusalem specifically. He didn't say to his local Levite. Notice that. Understand these will be exiled in 165 BC to Qumran, the biblical Beth Abara, even though the church has lost track we did not watch our original canon series 
That's where Yahusha launched his ministry so we wouldn't lose these facts. Another tenth, okay, part, this is number two, okay, this is a different year. The next year, it's a different year of tithing. This will become very clear when we read Deuteronomy, which Tobit followed. In other words, number one that we just covered, he does not tithe to the second year. You'll find he does not tithe to them the third year either. This is how the tithe works. I sold away and went and spent it every year at Jerusalem. On what? On keeping the feast, traveling to get there, lodging, uh, keeping the feast himself, uh, the, the notion that the temple always cooked all the food for millions of people. No, no, people were, were doing this all over the city. Oh, wait, did he just say he gave this tithe every year? See, no, he did not. See, he said he gave this the second year of the tithe or 10% from that year's increase only. Understand that. We want to be super clear here so no one can take this out of context and no one will miss it. He set it aside and used it to go to and fund the feast as commanded. And we still are. And we'll go there too. There are three each year that are pilgrimage feasts, travel feasts, uh, that one, the males, were required to keep in Jerusalem at that time when the temple stood and his Holy of Holies was there. No, there's no temple right now. His Holy of Holies is in the Garden of Eden in the Philippines. And ultimately, if we're going to be traveling to where his Holy of Holies, where his name is written, we should be going to the Philippines three times a year. Hmm, think about that. But anyway, Tobit already said he did, by the way. Uh, he, he traveled to Jerusalem and kept the feasts every year, the three feasts at least. Maybe he even went more. We don't know. He didn't say. But we know that the three are commanded. Uh, and those are Passover unleavened bread. Really, it's four if you want to look at it that way because uh, that's two feasts. But Passover unleavened bread, which, which tie together, especially in timing. Um, two, Shavuot. Uh, so you've got April uh, for Passover, and then Shavuot is in essentially early June uh, on our calendar. And then you have Tabernacles, which is an eight-day feast, which takes place in October, roughly. So there you go. Now, he used the second year tithe, only 10%. He did not give 20% that year. No, he still only gave 10. It's still a tithe. It's still a tenth. That doesn't change. Uh, and this is where people like MacArthur uh, are following Josephus, who tries to add those together, because that's what Pharisees do. They want more money. They made it a tax. Yes, he's right when he says that it's a tax in Pharisee language. He just doesn't realize he's talking like a Pharisee. He's sharing Pharisee history, and he doesn't know how to read the Bible. And we'll show you that. We'll prove it. So, the tithe is a tenth. This is all he gave each year. A tenth, okay, as far as tithing is concerned. Yes, he gave almsgiving, he calls it. He gave over and above, especially to the poor, the widows, the orphans, but we all should be doing that too. But there's also a year for that, so hang on. So this is a three-year cycle of three different purposes each year. The money, the tithe, is 10% of that year for each of these. The same year. Oh, Deuteronomy's going to tell you that. I, that's not. It's never been a mystery. Deuteronomy says you don't add them together. Uh, but anyway, one telling you you must tithe more than 10% doesn't know the definition of the word uh, and is inept as far as scripture is concerned. Again, you can give offerings over and above. That is up to you at any time if you feel led. But that's not a tithe. And then who do we tithe to? Oh, wait. Okay, so we have two different years here. The temple priests only got the tithe one of the years. Hmm. So, and the third, the third of what? The third year in a three-year cycle of giving a different purpose each 
year. This is the Bible way to tithe, and it's much simpler. It may seem a little complex to some who looked at it differently before, but this is the Bible way to tithe. Again, we'll go to Deuteronomy. I gave unto them to whom it was meet, as Deborah, my, mother, my father's mother, had commanded me, because I was left an orphan by my father. What's he talking about? Uh, well, Tobit gave the third year's 10% from that year's increase, let's be clear, and only the third year's increase, no other. All of it he gave to the poor and the needy, the widows and the orphans, as he was growing up. Yes, he also gave alms to them over and above, uh, and that's, that's fine. We should always give to the poor. Uh, Messiah especially has many passages where he tells us that we're supposed to take care of the poor and the needy, the widow and the orphan. This is not a surprise, uh, but that's not a tithe when you do so. Only this third year is, and again, it's not the only year you give to the poor. You give to the poor other times. It's just not a tithe. This is a tithe. This is built in. But wait a minute. Churches are collecting that tithe from the widows and orphans. Hmm. It is an offering. It is an offering, and we can all give as much as we want. Uh, anything outside of this year, but this tithe, this ten percent of our increase in the third year of tithing doesn't go to a church. It doesn't go to an organization. Organizations typically very weighted in staff. Uh, you look at things like UNICEF, you got over 90% is being spent on the staff, uh, on the CEO, on the board, on the overhead, uh, and not on the people, not on the purpose of the fund. Many ask us what we do, and Anna and I give away well, far more than a tithe, but we do tithe. Uh, this is the biblical formula, understood, however. Uh, we'll get to that uh, in the New Testament even soon. Don't worry, we're going to, it, this is going to be like five videos. Now before we go to a chart of Tobit's tithe, let us understand the Bible word used here in this case. Uh, in Hebrew is uh, mahashar. Uh, it means tithe or tenth, which are the same word. Ten percent, period. Not eleven percent, not nine percent, ten percent, and most certainly not twenty-three percent. John MacArthur, learn how to read. The number is biblical, yes, and that's all they gave as a tithe. Giving it to a church is, well, not actually a tithe. You haven't seen that in either of these roles have you, unless that church, as the temple priests, are leading you in keeping the feasts and the Sabbaths. That's what the Bible defines. So, and again, that's just one year's tithe. Every third year from that year's increase only, not the other two years. Otherwise, we are giving offerings to a church whenever we give. Now, John MacArthur will tell you, that that's the case, that you only give offerings to a church. Look, there's nothing wrong with giving to a church. Go ahead and give. If you're being fed, give. However, if it's a church not keeping the biblical feasts and Sabbaths, it does not qualify for the tithe. And when they're teaching against it, even more so. See, the mechanism is built in for us to be able to keep his ways over man's ways. And this is critical. Okay, let's clarify with this chart. And again, we'll take our time with this. So when Tobit lived in northern Israel, he would travel at least three times a year to Jerusalem to keep the feast as commanded in Scripture. He was giving biblically exactly as Scripture says to give. We'll show you. Uh, the first year he gave 10% of that year's increase and only that year's as a tithe. 10% of what? What is increase? Whatever is over and above what you already had when the year began. Now, it's pretty simple, and there are, you know, caveats. People want to get into 
discussions. What about this? And, you know, what if X equals Y equals C plus, you know, uh, K to the third power, whatever. Hey, hey, hey. No, it's, it's pretty simple. You will determine it, okay? It's increase. You make your commitment to Yahuwah and you keep it. You do not lie to the Holy Spirit as was done in the New Testament and a couple died not because they didn't give 10%. They died because they lied to the Holy Spirit and they didn't keep what they committed to give, regardless of what that was. Understand that. Is it about food? Is it about what you grow? We hear that all the time. You'll read that in, on Google especially. Uh, yes, it is. That was the culture in Bible times. Uh, many don't grow food today, but food was currency. It was a barter method in many cases. Yeah, they had money too. They had shekels, right? Uh, so, so money was in its infancy, it, it wasn't like it is today where everything is purchased essentially with money and very little bartering is done today uh, for the average folk. And understandable, hey, things change, that's fine, but we can understand this. It's really not difficult. So food was what? Food was currency. Food was income. If you're a farmer, you absolutely are growing crops and that, those crops are income. Uh, and again, it's over and above whatever you had before you went in to the year. And then at the end of the year, whatever your increase was, that's what you tithe on. You want to know if it's net or gross? You decide. That no pastor can. They have no right to even answer the question because the Bible does not even go there. Why doesn't it? Because it doesn't need to. This is not about legalism. And that's what they're doing. They're making it, just like the Pharisees are making it about legalism. Yes, that was the culture in Bible times. And many don't grow food today. We understand that. Uh, is it uh, about cattle? Well, yes, it is, if you have such. But we'll quickly go through the scriptures in one of these videos. Again, cattle also is currency right? Uh, and in, in lots of ways. If you have a cow that gives milk, right, uh, then the milk is currency, right? You can trade in a barter system. You can trade your milk for a chicken, you know, or whatever you want or need. Uh, but we're going to go through all of that and we'll spend a video uh, really explaining that and, and hammering down on it. Why? Because that's what we do. We want to understand. And when we open up a topic like this, we do uh, disassemble it, break it down into its parts, and try to understand each one as best we can. Perfectly? No. We're not about perfection, but we will do it with excellence, and we will be thorough in our examination. So, We'll go through the scriptures uh, as well in one of these videos. Uh, we're not going to do that in this particular one, just some. And you will see, yeah, it said food. Yeah, it's, it says what you grow uh, and the produce of your land. It says cattle. Uh, wait a minute, what gives? I mean, I don't have any cattle. I don't have a farm, right? So, oh, that means I don't need to tithe. Is that what it says? Where exactly do we get that from any of scripture? Did Messiah say stop tithing? Whoops. Oh, Tobit was a merchant. Tobit had a financial income of, largely, money. And Tobit gave money. Now, understand, being a merchant is not new. Just a lot more of us are uh, as employees or business owners or whatnot. Uh, but the dynamic is there in Scripture. It always has been. Everyone did not rely only on the land and cattle. So, now we all know in that age, culture was different. That shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, but how do we transpose that into today? Do we ignore this because, well, culture's changed, so just abolish the tithe completely? Yahushua didn't. Because he said in Matthew 5 that his law cannot pass away. And the tithe is part of it, whether we like it or not. It really doesn't matter what we like or don't like. Yahuwah said to give this. Why? Where did it start? Well, it didn't start with Moses. Abraham tithed. Whoops. 
and that in scripture is the first tithe. We're going to go and cover that, the history of tithing, in a video as well, and that'll be really good. So why would it not continue to be a tenant? Hmm. See, when the Old Testament does not change something like this, and oops, it never does. See, they have to produce a passage that says, stop tithing. And they can't because there is none. Therefore, we do not stop tithing. However, we need to understand what tithing is according to the Bible. Now, again, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. It didn't change, folks. And that's in the New Testament, last I checked. Uh, that, that's just a fact and a fact that many churches are unaware uh and that regards you know that's the that's tithing that's the feast that's the sabbaths uh that's his ways his law generally has not changed and can not change i am yahuwah thy elohim i change not says malachi you know yahushua said uh, or well not he didn't actually say it but what does the New Testament tell us in Hebrews 13, I, I don't know, 8, something like that, or uh, wherever it is, uh, it says, Yahusha is the same yesterday. Well, yesterday for him is at creation because he has been since the beginning, today and forever. He doesn't change either. So if we have, uh, you know, if, if the Father and the Son don't change, their doctrines don't change. What we have is we have a whole new religion called Christianity that has very little foundation and basis in the Bible, which is why they don't understand Bible practices at all. Should we really view this as meaning it passed away when nothing ever says it does? Uh, or should we view it as validation of the same practice? Uh, again, test it for yourself you can figure these things out without a scholar. In fact, better without a scholar most of the time. They use the New Testament as a different religion because they're not applying it properly. They're taking fragments out of Paul who kept the Sabbath, who kept the feast. Now, watch our Sabbath series. We prove that indisputably. Read Rest, the Case for Sabbath. Free and ebook, restsabbath.org. We prove that. They don't even read nor understand the Bible. They're just relying on doctrines of men. And many of them come from Pharisees. Even though they may demonize it, they're following Pharisee doctrine. They draw illiterate conclusions such as, oh, well, it must have passed away then. Uh, yet it is mentioned in the New Testament and we will go there too. The point is not even true. <laughs> Watch these videos and test this for yourself because we're going to go there. Uh, some then discount income as an employee or merchant, okay? But let's be clear, Tobit was, I want to repeat this because I want everybody to understand, Tobit was a merchant, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean he didn't own, uh, in fact, there's a passage where he was given a goat, his wife was given a goat as income. See, again, that's not rare for that age because rather than money, they gave a goat. Okay, that is normal, for that society. Just because we don't understand that today doesn't change anything. So, and that's when he was taken captive into Assyria after he was blinded. His wife uh, got a job, and when she got a job, uh, she was at one point given uh, a goat. So, uh, again, that's the barter system by trade, and he was a merchant, so he understood that, uh, but he also understood money. He gave all of his increase as a merchant which means it included money. Uh, it included income. Uh, everything considered increase. It's not just about food. And again, we're going to deal with that in a whole video. Don't worry. So basically, did Tovit view this as only food? The answer is no. Uh, increase is increase, a tenth or a tithe. Why? Because this is what Abraham did. He established a principle and we even have a promise with the principle. We do not give to get. No, that's with the wrong heart already. You already lost the battle there. However, if you give, you will, in fact, be blessed. So, uh, now, who do we give it to? 
Well, unless the church is keeping the Sabbaths and the feasts, uh, the tithe doesn't go to the church. You can give offerings. You can give to a church. That's fine. That's up to you. But it is voluntary. There's no such thing as a forced tithe that any church should be collecting or demanding unless they are, in fact, keeping the feasts and the Sabbaths. Uh, you don't give it to a synagogue, which there were none in Israel at that time either. That is Babylon. That's a Pharisee practice. They're the ones who established synagogues, right? Which is what largely churches are today in operation. It's very Freemasonic, really. It's Babylonian uh, in that essence. I'm not saying that all churches are Babylonian, but the concept is the bible ecclesia does not focus on church buildings why because they suck the resources of the local ecclesia community they would meet in public places at times hiding in private places they would meet in homes uh, one time they met by the riverside uh, basically what we'd call parks today largely uh, etc uh, we will address new testament tithing in the next videos don't worry uh, we're going to get there, but it's too much to cover here in one video. We're trying to explain this and teach it. Try to debate it before we covered it. Be muted. Our channel, our rules. No debate in ignorance here. Yes, we answer challenges, but we do not answer debate done in ignorance, which clearly someone has not even viewed our position. So year one, Tobit gave 10% of that year, and only that year, to the temple priests who were managing the temple worship system. Clear? He did not give it to all Levites even, but specifically to those operating the temple, those in charge of the Sabbaths and the feast. Yes, there were courses, priestly courses, and some of the other uh, families, of course, did serve in the temple. All of them served for the feasts. Uh, so that is true. Uh, but why? These had nothing otherwise. See, the Levites had no land inheritance. Uh, again, no farming operations, no businesses, no means of income. This was their income. They were completely committed to the temple, as they should be, uh, totally to worship, uh, at least when they were doing it right. Yahuwah built this mechanism in to keep their focus on his worship there. They had no excuses. Their needs were provided for. Yes, this food would supply for their needs as well as money. Because they needed money too, even in, those age, in that age. Gold or whatever currency in whatever age. Uh, over time, many things have had value. Uh, usually anything that's, that is uh, rare uh, in certain societies will become, you know, currency of sort. Uh, I know somebody's going to say, oh, but the definition of currency is who cares. The point is how we use it today as money. This is why Yahushua was angry and turned over the pawnbroker and bankers tables of the Pharisees who are still the same today. That hasn't changed. Uh, they were operating in front of the temple then, but they still do today. True temple priest had no such practices and would focus on his worship. That's what their role was. This will not occur again until the third year, once every three years of that year's tithe only, which is the biblical way to tithe, period. Don't worry, I'm going to get to Deuteronomy in a moment. The entire second year's tithe, or 10% of all his increase from that year only, would be set aside and spent or used, yes, annually. He would spend it annually, but it was based on the fund set up the second year. It's 10% of that year's increase only, even though he's spending it each year. Yes. This went, it's, but it's still the one amount he sets aside, puts in a fund, and he would draw on that fund for three years. Then every third year, he would come back and give that full year's tithe, 10%, to travel for the feast, funding the feast, keeping the feast in every way. So, now, did the feast pass away? Again, not according to Scripture, as the apostles kept the feast and the Sabbaths after Yahushua ascended. Oops, 
I, I don't understand why the church can't read, uh, even out of all, uh, to assume that they could possibly pass away, yet you've got the, the apostles still keeping them after Yahushua uh, resurrected. Were they in rebellion then? Because they would be based on the church. No, the church is in rebellion on that topic, let's be clear. And even the early true ecclesia, especially those listed in Revelation, we're still keeping the biblical feast, not Christmas, not Easter. Those are occult holidays. Uh, and they were keeping the Bible Sabbath on Saturday, never Sunday, um, or at least not in the beginning. And it was the Catholic Church that forced uh, you know, Sunday into some of their practices. Uh, we even cover this in After the Apostles and Read Rest. Uh, you will find uh, some of them started doing double duty and they would have worship on Saturday and Sunday and then eventually Saturday was phased out and Sunday took over. The fact is Sabbath never changed. The Bible never changes it. The Catholic Church has no right to change it. Never did, never will. Uh, no Pope uh, will ever have such authority. Yahusha is Lord of the Sabbath. That's what he says in uh, Mark 2, 27, 28. And only he could have changed the Sabbath and he did not know his death uh, in resurrection, uh, he didn't die on a Sunday, and he didn't resurrect on a Sunday biblically. Yes, it was before uh, sunrise on what we call Sunday, but it's still considered Saturday because the Bible day starts with the sun at sunrise, and it was still Saturday before the sun rose. Watch when does the Bible day begin series. We prove that no one will ever disprove it that is a serious issue as in order for them to receive the tithe of the temple priests if the church wants to replace temple priests well they better be conducting the bible holy days and not the world's i mean that that's just lunacy to even think about keeping the birthday of the sun god and uh the the fertility ritual of easter easter yeah same thing Few churches do. They are, they are inept when it comes to these things, these basic principles of the Bible. How did that happen? Well, because those who crept in unawares, watch after the apostles, yeah, the Catholic Church, largely, yeah, they changed the whole practice. They instituted a new religion, which was an infusion with Mithraism, which is what Constantine was, a high priest of Mithraism, not a Christian. They say, oh, he converted on his deathbed. That's stupid because he was setting tenets uh, and overseeing the setting of tenets uh, for the uh, so-called Christian church all along. So what was he doing it from? From the foundation of his high priesthood, of Mithraism. Oops, that's pretty bad. In other words, few churches are actually even entitled to a tithe. Certainly the Catholic Church is out. Sorry folks, we deal in facts here. You can give still to a church if you want. It's up to you, but let's be clear, it is not a tithe, again, unless they're keeping the biblical holy days and leading you in doing so. It's an offering. Otherwise, any church not doing so demanding a tithe, that's unbiblical. They have no right to a tithe. They don't get to use the law they preach against in sin. That's the definition of sin, lawlessness, according to James. Uh, or preach against his ways and then say, you know, they're going to use his law to collect money. It doesn't work. Uh, I know a lot of denominations go there and it, uh, it is lunacy uh, in every way. Then, the third year, again, in a cycle of three years, which repeats afterwards. Um, so it, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, just like the dance, right? It's, it's, that's it. It repeats, and, and that's the way it works. The in, it, Look, if you want to take a year and say a third, a third, a third uh, of the tenth, that, that's up to you. Uh, it's, it's really up to you. But make your commitment and keep your word right? That's the way this works. The entire 10% from that year's increase, anything over and above what Tobit had uh, entering that year. It's not about net worth, right? Uh, no, it does not operate like a tax. 
You don't get double, you don't double tithe and triple tithe on the very same thing. Um, you know, very same income that you already had uh, the previous year. If he had a hundred cattle, for instance, uh, let me explain this, the previous year, and he was to tithe, right? He's entering a new year. He would only tithe on the increase of that cattle. So not on the hundred, but whatever the hundred increased into. Uh, he wouldn't go backwards and give 10%, uh, you know, uh, 10 head, basically, uh, of cattle each year, 10%. Uh, that operates like a tax if he was to do it that way. It's not how the tithe works. Uh, it is about increase constantly in scripture over and over. And again, we're going to cover more scriptures uh, as we go through the series. If his cattle increased from 100 cattle the previous year and entering this year's tithe, he now has 150 that year or produced throughout. Uh, and you can calculate that whichever way. Just make your commitment, okay? It's your decision. Make your commitment and keep it. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Then he would give 10% of the increase. Uh, the increase is 50 over and above the previous year, right? Because he went from 100 cattle to 150. This is just an analogy. This is just, you know, a hypothetical. So five would be given that year as a tithe. Not 15, right? You don't add the 10 and the five. No, just the five the, the, based on the increase of 50 head. That's the way this works. Anything over and above is an offering. Uh, again, which you're welcome to do. But just don't call it a tithe. It's not what a tithe is. It's not a requirement. Indeed, income is different. Yes, uh, they will argue whether we give net or gross before or after taxes. You decide and don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Keep your commitment. Scripture does not say, and again, any pastor demanding 10% of uh, net or gross or whichever, uh, is not literate biblically. It, he shouldn't even be entering that conversation because that's not there. What does the Bible say about this? Well, it is so simple. It does not require a whole lot of verses to understand it. Uh, Tobit probably breaks down the best as he is just recording how he gave. And again, we're going to go to the history of tithing as well in this series, uh, not for Apocrypha, but we're, we're going to, again, spin off this new uh, The Bible Tithe uh, series. But let's go to Deuteronomy and really understand this. And now with Tobit, with this chart, you can understand how we should be reading Deuteronomy and how they always did in Bible times. The Pharisees, they're wrong. They do not apply it this way. And we'll go to the origin of that too. Don't worry, we're going to expose that in this video. The next video is coming on the heels of this one. It's already pretty much done, so look for it soon over the next day. And that will complete this launching of our Bible Tithe series as well. Uh, we'll cover one more on Tobit, uh, which will include an Apocrypha uh, test. And next, dispelling the nonsensical, illiterate criticism of some of its doctrine in terms of money, and we'll show you uh, the New Testament affirms Tobit, oops, uh, uh, yeah, uh, even from Messiah himself. Wow. This is a book of super value, and no wonder it is likely the most attacked in Apocrypha. Then we'll branch off and address John MacArthur in a video and we'll get into the history of tithing and whether the Bible is uh, tithe is only about food. Ah, we hear that from many, is it? These are answering with doctrines of men without any biblical research. We'll get there and man is that sad to see. Always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.